I've been thinking a bit more about the play grade thing, right? And um, my, my opinion on it just keeps moving and shifting and changing a bit, you know, I say la vie, because I like to think about these things a bit deeply and not just give my knee-jerk opinion around it. But I was kind of thinking a lot about the interview with Bicep and Independent the other day that I mentioned in the podcast, right? Then they made obviously a good point in terms of um, the issue isn't the playgrounds because they're obviously going to happen. The issue mostly is that for the most part, all the footage that we've seen of these parties are taking place in various dubious locations around the world where certain governments are probably not taking the, are not probably applying the precautions that are needed in order to look after the populace. And these years has obviously taken advantage of it as all the promoters. But they're obviously, for the most part, the footage we've seen, it always features people you would maybe deem to be on the more affluent end of the DJing pay schedule. Or the DJing pace scale and I really hate to mention it because I do think it's a bit yucky when other people sort of like look up people's pockets and say hey why do you need that when you have this and stuff I just think it just comes across a bit gross but there's no denying that it is odd that the people who you would think would be the ones that get paid the most in terms of DJing fees and brand sponsorships and all that malarkey are the ones that are trying their best to ensure that they're playing every playgrave that they can get a hand on in order to make sure they're in front of a crowd because you would imagine a lot of these people don't need to I don't say don't need to be but it's not as if being in front of a crowd is foreign to them it's not as if they're like a plucky um underground dj who is kind of desperate to get in front of a crowd because it's been a year that they haven't been you know surrounded by strangers in a dark basement rave somewhere these are people who play week in week out sometimes you know free gigs in one week free free gigs on one day in various locations across europe so taking some time away from it especially for a short period of time in comparison to their entire career because dj you can do until you know way 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 into your old age right it's not something that requires um your body to be uh, a young sprightly gentleman or madame in order for you to continue doing a career so it's not as if it's like the time out the two years or one year that we've kind of been living in some sort of lockdown is going to negative affect their career in any meaningful way so it's just curious that this is happening continually especially with the people that occupy the top end and one big example of this is solomon right somebody who i'm a big fan of somebody who i think um approaches the art of DJing in a very business sort of professional relentless fashion right he's known as the king of the after party um he's known of he's known to play you know 10 hour sets in a club and then play the after party for another six hours you know non-stop uh no no sitting down no look of tightness about him whatsoever just going for it continually right and he's one of the rare ones as well in that kind of business techno group where he's actually a proficient um dj right he's somebody who a lot of people would think has good taste right there are probably sets of his that you could listen to and pl- pick out a couple of the tunes that you would probably play in your set right regardless of what genre you play i'd imagine right i'd imagine maybe objectively you can objectively i think a lot of people would say he's a good dj right so he occupies that weird space where he's respected by you know the djs djs and also respected by people who you know spend their times on private jets and wearing uh dc10 merch right he's probably respected by those two crowds so it's just curious to see that he's one of the people again who's playing these dubious skeptical parties in tulum that may or may not be funded by cartels and may or may not be adding to the you know surge in covid cases and deaths all across the mexico and this is another example of it where it looks like he's playing in some sort of villa it looks like right because a lot of these clips that we're seeing now they don't look like they're taking place in clubs so i'm assuming nightclubs aren't open in the conventional sense so they're having to do a lot of these raves in airbnbs and villas and penthouses and private you know uh households whatever it may be and um yeah uh, it's just odd again like it's just odd considering that he's one of the top paid djs in the scene if you believe what you read online um i think someone said something along the lines of uh Masio plex was booked to play i think i might have seen this on reddit Masio plex was paid to book at um so take a pinch of salt but supposedly Masio plex when he was booked to play at junction two one of the previous years he was paid anywhere between I'm going to say they say 20 to 50 grand, right? Which is a quite a big scale, but let's say 30 to 50. 
if you get paid 30 to 50 grand to pay a set in a normal a normal time what do you think your lowest they're going to take during a pandemic is going to be five to ten grand maybe right so there's more time that you spent making 50 or let's say the average of 30 grand per set and you play two sets per day that's a lot of scrunch that's a lot of it's a lot of dough right a lot and probably a, a lot of dough that would probably go far in a lot of countries especially the ones that these guys tend to live in right there's rarely you hear of djs say that they live in paris or sweden or even london right they usually pick places that are fairly affordable where your money can maybe travel and go a bit longer than what it might do in more expensive cities so why do they need to fly to Tulum to go and play these parties? Is it just because they want to get in front of a crowd or is it generally because they need the money? And if they do generally need the money, then what have they did with, what did they do with all the other fees that they got paid playing all these other places? Even when you include the agency's um, rates that are taken out of your, what you're paying your manager, you're still getting left with, you know, a sizable amount from just playing a couple of records or just paying like an hour or two sets, right, in places. And that's also your way to imagine outside of Solomon, before I play the video, outside of Solomon, a lot of these people play conventional club sets, and even in festivals, right? One to two hours, if that. Solomon's probably the exception. He plays pretty much, he plays pretty much, I think, minimum of four hours and up. But most of these people I'm going to feature on this, or I'm going to mention, they usually just play an hour or two hours of the set, right? Most of the music they're playing is fairly generic and disposable and very, very forgettable but this is what's driving them to travel half halfway around the world to play these weird places and again maybe it's not their fault it's mostly the fault of the government maybe it's mostly the fault of people that are attending the parties in the first place who knows it's just interesting and weird to think that somebody of his status and financial earning power needs to play a rave in tulum during this time but hey what do i know let's play the video <laughs> And this is courtesy of Business Techno, by the way, on Twitter, you'll be able to find them. Don't get me wrong, it looks fun because it's, it's always fun to see people partying and having a good time. But pfft, my word, my word. Oh well, yeah, I don't know. I guess this is a more video for you. So again, like I said, who knows what is, uh, I, I, that's, that's why I kind of, kind of pose the question. What do you guys think is driving some of this, uh, this desire for these people who are, you know, again, like I say, who operate at the highest uh, point in terms of earning potential in the dance music scene as DJs, what is this tendency for them to go to play these play graves? Because again, like I said, with the exception of that one rave in New Year's Day in Ukraine, that Sally C, Freddie K, and a few other people went to play that, I've not really seen many other raves that have happened past summer where people that you would think would generally need the money have played at. There are, obviously they do exist. I'm sure they've have done behind the scenes. Um, I've heard of people doing Zoom private corporate events. I've heard of people doing stuff behind closed doors in bunkers. I know it's happening, but the ones that we see getting covered for the most part are only the bigger kind of glitzier DJ Maggie, Mix Mag type of people that are playing. And obviously the interesting part of it also on top of it is that most of the big publications aren't covering this, right? Your Mix Mags and DJ Mags and Resident Advisor, they're not covering this. And the reason why, most of the reason, if you think deeply about this, is that if you check some of the booking information of some of these people, they're all kind of um, 
on the same rosters right i think the one group is called liaisons or something like that right and a lot of these same people that are featured on business Tech and a few other places they're all signed to the same agency so is this some sort of weird collusion that these uh dance music publications that speak about everything else in the culture aren't willing to speak about parts prominent people in the industry essentially adding to um the misery and the pain in various parts of the world by playing these raves in places that they probably shouldn't be at and taking advantage of lackadaisical government governmental control why wouldn't they cover it and they're not which is a really really curious and dubious thing to see they just refuse to cover it they just kind of pretend it's not happening like the whole daniel wang and peggy goo situation what actual big dance music publication do you see cover it none zero right because i didn't want to get involved because you know she signed to a certain agency who signed to a certain label and all this sort of stuff and you don't want to upset that place because you won't get able to be able you won't be able to feature this person or get an interview it's really really odd and very very odd, strange and bizarre and again like i said the only people that it seems to benefit are the people that operate at the top end of the scale so why do you think this is happening why do you think someone like a solomon needs to go to a tollum to go and play when he plays normal festivals and raves pre-covid and he gets paid anywhere between 30 to 50k um to play an event of course he's not getting that money clean in his pocket he has to pay expenses he's got a family well this is well whatever else make your make your stipulations and again like i said i feel disgusting even mentioning someone else's earning but it is a, a, a valid question to ask isn't it like why is it only the more affluent DJs are the ones playing these faves and not the ones who actually need it. What's actually happening there? Is it because they just have an insustainable urge to be in front of a crowd and they don't want to be forgotten? They don't want to be, um, they want to kind of make sure that they're somewhat quote unquote relevant. What is driving this? What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your opinion regarding it.